Hello, I'm Susan Meyer, Associate Professor of Art at the Center for Art and Design at the College of St. Rose. Welcome to our first panel discussion for the exhibition Earthly at the Esther Masry Gallery at the College of St. Rose. Gallery manager Aaron Sickler and I co-curated the exhibition and we're both excited about the show and grateful to have worked with five wonderful artists. Julie Evans, Lale Koramian, Meg Lipke, Odessa Straub, and Tamara Zahikevich. Many thanks to Gina Ochiogrosso, Rob O'Neill, Ali DeRusso, and Bella Burnett for their help installing. Robert Shane for programming, and Aaron Sickler for being so great to work with. Art history professor Robert Shane will moderate a second panel discussion with Lali Koramian and Odessa Straub on Monday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. And St. Rose English professor Barbara Unger will conduct a poetry reading in conjunction with the exhibition on Tuesday, February 9th at 7 p.m. Both of these events, like tonight's, will be via Zoom. We hope you will visit the gallery to see this beautiful show. It runs through March 17th. Visits are by, by appointment until February 1st. After February 1st, hours are Monday through Saturday from noon to 5 p.m., Wednesday and Thursday from noon to 8 p.m., closed Sunday. The exhibit is free and open to the public. Visitors must call the gallery phone at 518-337-2390, that number's on the website, to gain entrance to the building. Due to COVID-19 precautions, all gallery visitors are asked to fill out a simple survey and social distancing is required. A teaching gallery, the Esther Masry Gallery is the curricular cornerstone for all art and design programs at the College of St. Rose. The gallery encourages understanding of art through innovative education programs, critical thinking, and dialogue. It supports active learning and involvement with changing concepts, challenging topics, and visual forms relevant to contemporary society. It also serves the campus by expanding the setting for educational opportunities and is a cultural resource for the community, the capital region, and the Northeast. And now I go on to introduce the artists and I ask each artist to say hello so that the audience can identify them. So enjoy the panel discussion, thank you. Julie Evans is a native New Yorker who's been living and working in Hudson since 2011. Reviews of her work have appeared in the New York Times, Art Forum, Art in America, The New Yorker, Flash Art, and many other publications. Evans' exhibitions include those at Julie Saul Gallery, Leslie Heller Workspace, the Weatherspoon Art Museum, Wave Hill, John Davis Gallery, Denise Torrey, Jeff Bailey Gallery, Jeffrey Young Gallery, Mackenzie Fine Art, and many others. She is the recipient of a Fulbright Scholarship to India, as well as residency fellowships to McDowell, Yaddo, UCross, Millay and Tamarind Institute. Evans' work is included in over 300 international public and private collections. Meg Lipke lives and works in New York's Hudson Valley. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Vermont and her Master's in Painting from Cornell University. Lipke's work has been exhibited at Jeff Bailey Gallery, September Gallery, Moore College of Art, TSA Philadelphia, Morgan Lehman, Gold Montclair, and most recently, Broadway Gallery, New York City. Yay! Lipke is a 2020 recipient of the New York Foundation of the Arts Fellowship in Craft Sculpture. Her work has been featured in many publications, including Art in America, The New York Times, The Brooklyn Rail, The New Yorker, and The Village Voice. Tamara Zahaikevich lives and works in East Chatham, New York. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from Tyler School of Art, Temple University. Numerous solo exhibitions include those at Jeff Bailey Gallery in Hudson, New York, Kansas in New York, New York, and Bellwether in Brooklyn. Recent group exhibitions include Cut and Color at the Albany International Airport Gallery, 
Earthly Delights at the Re Institute in Miller, Millerton, New York, Objecti at Tiber Denage, New York, New York, and This One's Optimistic, Pincushion, at the New Britain Museum of Art in Connecticut. She is the recipient of two Pollock Krasner Foundation grants and has attended numerous residencies, including the Dudonet Workspace Program, the Sharp Olentas Studio Program, McDowell, and the Skohagen School of Painting and Sculpture. Zahekiewicz has been featured in articles for Bomb Magazine, Hyperallergic, and the Brooklyn Rail, among many other publications. So, quite the group. <laughs> okay, so for the first question, and we're running this like a panel discussion so that we can have the artists have a bit of a conversation. Um, I've also asked for some of the questions, um, I've asked a few former St. Rose students to, um, to interject with some questions and I'll let them know when, and I'm just gonna introduce them with a little bio beforehand. So our first question, gallery manager Aaron Sickler and I began researching and doing studio visits for this show in fall of 2019. We were wrapping up visits in early 2020 as COVID-19 was making its way to the States. The show has been delayed several times because of the pandemic. And for me, the pandemic has altered how I view and interpret the works in the show. Affirming my so psychic somersaults over the last many months, I feel kind of a warm hug of recognition from the show, from the humanity of the works. Um, to the artists, how do you think artwork is speaking to you in this most particular time? And related to that, I wonder how you cultivate, respond to, and address the notion of change in your work. <laughs> That's a mouthful. That is a mouthful. So I thought like if we were to start with someone, Meg, would you like to start with this sure. one? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Hi, everyone. It's such, um, such a fun uh, time to be doing this with Julie and Tamara. And thank you to Aaron and to Susan for curating this show. Um, okay, so that's a pretty big question. Um, I'm gonna try to take it piece by piece. Um, right now, um, during COVID, um, I, like everybody, have been spending a lot more time indoors and a lot more time looking at um, the work that is by my friends, which is on my walls. Um, and I found that, um, that I'm thinking a lot more about it. And so the pieces, um, as I'm engaging with them, I feel like are really talking to me, um, or maybe I'm even projecting more meaning than, than usual onto, um, works that are on our walls, even my children's works. Um, you know, I, I have been thinking a lot about um, life and death during this past year. In fact, when Susan and Aaron came in the beginning of 2020 to my studio, I got a phone call moments before they arrived that my father was um, dying. And he did die uh, in early 2020, just before COVID happened. So he didn't die of COVID, um, which I'm grateful for. Um, but um, my experience of making work since that point, so really my experience of making work over the last year, um, has been um, one in which I have really kind of faced a, a despair about wondering what it even means um, to make artwork and does it matter, you know? Um, that was sort of when I was early in um, the stages of grief. Um, and I have come around full circle um, in feeling like, yes, it's really, really important to make work. It's important for me to make work. It's important for me to um, encourage my friends and my community of artists um, 
to make work. I feel like it is really affirming. I feel like we can, as artists, comment on, um, you know, themes of growth and reemergence um, and the cycle of life. And I feel really, really lucky, um, you know, that that this is what I do um, because this year it's really helped me um, figure out. I don't know, just, just feeling really connected, I guess, to, um, to what really feels important to me. Um, gosh, did I answer everything in that question? <laughs> did I miss a section? That was lovely. Yeah. Okay. okay. And maybe Julie, would you want to? Sure. Ian? Um, well, like Meg, I want to thank you guys for curating this show, which looks beautiful from the images. I can't wait to see it in person. And Meg, I'm so sorry about your dad. I'm so sorry for your loss. That's really hard. It's Thank you. Some year. What a year. What a year. What a year. I have to say, well, I started the year with a, with a stroke. I had a stroke at the very beginning in February. And I just dodged a bullet. Um, cause I'm absolutely fine, which started me realizing how lucky I am. And then through this whole year, I've just been really focused in the studio and I can't believe how lucky I am. I'm so grateful for my practice and I'm so grateful that that's what I get to do every day. And I think, I think to have a place to go where you can literally just have your mind come away from the insanity that's going on. Because when I'm not in my studio, I'm very, my throat is tight, <laughs> my shoulders hurt, I'm very stressed out because of what's going on. But, and now my dog is squeaking his toy. But, uh, you know, thank God for, for art, I would say. I've been looking at a lot more. <laughs> I have to admit, it's mostly on Instagram. But I'm just sort of really reveling in this time because everything is so crazy outside the studio. And then the studio is the place where my life is normal and things can really just be about what I'm doing. And, you know, I think we all feel a little guilty um, for being so fortunate. But also it makes me feel like, cause so many people are having panels, you know, how has your work changed? How is this time affecting your work? How are you addressing this, these times in your work? And I can't say that, I, that my work is addressing these times. My, address, my work is addressing my psyche in these times. Um, and I think I'm just seeking out um, sort of the kind of uh, quiet, energy and uh, nourishment, I guess, if you want to say. I'm, I'm nourishing myself. And then your, your greatest hope is that your work nourishes somebody else. Um, so that's what this time has been about. Just feeling really, uh, really, gra really grateful. Really grateful. While everybody is suffering, I feel bad. <laughs> I feel guilty. But anyway, but art's important. It's very important. And how about Tamara? Do you? Yeah, um, I'm really happy to be in the show with these great artists. And um, it's been really a pleasure to work with Susan and Aaron. And I wanted to say that for me, during this time, the structure of how I work has really changed compared to pre-pandemic. I'm working a lot more at night and I used to not work at night, but also I just have more un uninterrupted time that, and, and I'm, I'm also reevaluating how I spent this time before and once we can be very social again, can I cut back on some of that socializing that was interfering with my art practice? So those are thoughts that I have. But um, I've made a, a bigger effort to connect with, with artists here 
in, in, the, in Columbia County. And also I've been doing FaceTime um, art making sessions with close friends back in Brooklyn and, and, in, and in New Jersey. And I'm also um, texting images to other people showing them what I'm working on and, and getting having these these dialogues with other artists. So that's been really great. And art is really one of the only things that I can still do. I can go out and do here, even though it's, it's, uh, it, you can go see a show with a mask on and be the only person seeing the show. And I got to have that experience in our show the other day, which was incredible. And also um, just finding out anything that's going on around here and, and going out and meeting new people that way as well, new artists. Thank you. I'm going to introduce one of our guest um, students, Kelsey Renko. Um, Kelsey's a 2015 St. Rose graduate. She's a painter and she help, has helped found the collective The Church in Troy, New York. Um, she serves on the Curatorial Committee of Collar Works in Troy and is the Art Loan Program Coordinator at the Tang Teaching Museum in Saratoga Springs. And Kelsey um, is familiar with all the artists' work and wanted to, or I, I asked her if she'd like to ask a question and she nicely said yes. So Kelsey, where are you? Hello. Hi, Kelsey. Hi, thank you and congrats on this beautiful show. Um, I really can't wait to make an appointment and come see it in person. Um, so my question was um, just about um, talking about your decision to make artwork where you do. Um, so I live in Troy, so right near St. Rose, right outside of Albany. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, if you live in upstate New York, what do you feel the advantages and disadvantages are? Um, do you feel like you're missing out by not living in New York City and, and making artwork there? And kind of how are you making it work? What are you doing um, to kind of bridge that gap? Thank you. Hi, Kelsey. Can I go first? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, hi. That's a great question. Um, I think that you are not missing out if you're living upstate, but I do think that you have to be dedicated to trying to um, develop as much of a community as possible. And it sounds like um, you're really doing that already up here. Um, you know, for, um, for my part, I try to see friends shows in the city when I can. And I, and I try to do a lot of studio visits, although right now that's mostly through Zoom. Um, and I mean, I think that my studio in Bushwick was was maybe one tenth the size of my studio upstate. Um, and it's only because I work upstate that I'm allowed to make, um, you know, that I, that I um, have the possibility of making such large scale work. Uh, so <clears throat> I also feel like there's a real, there, you know, I mean, I wonder if Julie and Tamara feel this way too, or, or if you do, Kelsey, it feels like to me, there's been a real shift, you know, from maybe um, 10 years ago when, when I think many of us felt like we absolutely had to be in New York City to maybe have our work taken seriously. And I do not feel like that is the case now. Um, for example, when uh, somebody was recently um, visiting my studio from New York City and he said, gosh, you know, I'm doing more studio visits upstate than I am in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like there's been a real um, change and I feel like it, unless you, um, you know, have a lot of money saved up, 
um, it's likely that in order to keep your practice going, you might at some point or for your entire practice have a studio in a woodshed or a small room or in your dining room table. Or if you're super lucky, you know, um, a, a room outside of your living space. And, uh, you know, I just, well, anyway, I'll stop talking. Let somebody else talk. Um, I, I'm going to take that. Basically, when I moved to New York in the mid 90s, um, it was a lot easier to live in New York at the time. Things were a lot cheaper. And my community was much closer together geographically. Things were at walking distance or a quick subway ride. And increasingly from in the 20, toward the end of the 20 years that I was living there, I had moved many, many times, many, many studios. And they weren't, um, you know, like Meg said, they weren't big studios, but they were expensive. And, and I was always limited by what I could make or what I could really see, because I like to see a lot of my work at the same time. And, um, and I also felt because I was moving farther from, from the Nexus, I was moving far, all of us were spreading out. And that travel time really interfered with, um, you know, work time or, or I couldn't, you know, it was, it was very hard to do studio visits um, and go see shows and have an art practice and figure out how to pay the rent all at the same time. So I, th I think um, me being up here, um, I have my space, my workspace is connected to my house, but it's not in my house. And it's the first time I've ever had that. And it's also the largest space that I have had outside of participating in an artist residency where I would, which was short term. So this is something that I can build up over time. I can, uh, with time, do the improvements that I need to do to make the studio work well. But um, I, I think uh, in the beginning, I really loved living in the city in the 90s and I grew up near the city. So when I was um, young, really young, I used to really love being there and the energy of it. But as the city changed so much, I'm, I, I, I wasn't like, I wasn't able to hold on to that thing because it didn't exist anymore. So coming here is just a completely different life and everything here for me is very condensed as opposed to there where I was traveling constantly to get anything done. And, um, and like I said earlier, I'm making an effort to connect with new, new artists and, and um, taking advantage of what what's available to me here in the area. And you, there's something, um, first of all, the things that you're doing, Kelsey, I'm amazed that you do, you can do all that, that you're just involved with so many things. And that really, you know, shapes your life and it will shape the, the life of your work too. Um, I think, you know, community is really, really, really important. And I'm going to say something that's a little different than what the other two said, which is that I really felt when I'm, I never thought I'd leave the city. And when I did, because I finally just got so sick of having to be at so many openings all the time. Um, <laughs> I moved up here and I really felt, uh, I felt very isolated. And I still feel isolated, but here's the thing. It's not because I'm up here. I'm doing that to myself. I don't do studio visits. I don't visit other people. I don't reach out to that many other artists. So it sounds like because of the way you are, your, your, your work is just going to keep getting out there. Because it's really, I mean, it's sad to say this, but I say this to students all the time. Uh, your work is, for, for our career, a career in the art world, your work is really, sadly, 
the third most important factor because there's so many good artists out there and there's so many mediocre artists out there that are showing in wonderful places. But the most important thing about the art world is to be in it, to be in the middle of it. And when I was in the city, every single person I knew was an artist. And the only thing we ever talked about was who was in what gallery and who was, who was having a show where and did you hear this, did you hear that? And you know, you're, you're in this little vacuum and things percolate and that's where things happen. However, and now I'll switch my, what I'm saying. I think in, in the 30 years that I lived in the city, the art world has changed so much. In the very beginning, when I was there, I didn't get there till the early 90s. Uh, I, was, I didn't get out of my graduate program till 91, 92. The art world was very small. It was very central. It was, all the galleries were in Soho period. They had moved from the East Village. They were in Soho. That was it. You knew everybody who was showing anywhere. Whether you knew them personally or not, you knew them work, their work and you knew what was going on. Right now, it is so, there are so many art worlds. It's so splintered. It's so, it's so explosive. And the art world in Troy is just as, is just as important as the art world in one of the art worlds in, in some part of Brooklyn. Now, granted, you might not get as many dealers up to see your work, but there are so many more dealers. So it's, it's such a different art world now than it used to be. And I think I'm, after being here for 10 years, I'm really rethinking what I want for my work. I used to think one of these days I'll get back to getting into a gallery in the city and showing all the time. But now I'm thinking, no, my life is here. I'm making my work still on a daily basis. This is my art world or this should be my art world. I think, I think this whole year, this whole COVID thing has made me think more about that, that I really need to embrace what is right here, the artists that are here, the art world that is here. Because, you know, when you don't, when you're not out five, six nights a week going to openings and seeing, having friends come over and doing stuff and always working for deadlines for shows, you can sort of let things fall. So I think you do have to motiva motivate yourself more here because it's just you. But then again, that's me. You know, you've heard from two other people who are having studio visits over Zoom and, and, and FaceTiming with people. So I think, you know, in terms of an art, art life here or there, it's so about who you are. You can make it, you can make it happen for you wherever you are. So I know I said two completely opposite things, but it was a realization. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. And thanks, Kelsey. Um, so another question. Um, the process of making is apparent in the works. We see stitch marks, pooling, seams. Can you each speak about process a bit or how you reveal the process in your work? Um, and here, maybe we could start with Tamara. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so for me, process often will lead the piece. And um, so it's really in, in the making that, that the piece comes from. I have to be working. I, it's not like um, I have an idea and I go in there and I start doing it. I, I go in there and I start I hold the material, I touch it. There's a lot of touching and cutting and it's kind of obsessive. And at some point I decide if I'm gonna commit to, um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll think about color, sometimes I'll think about form. And, and some, I'll have to decide which of those things I wanna lead with. But when I make a commitment to a direction I'm going in, I also have to decide if I want the pieces to be, you know, the touching and the cutting to be messy 
or or could it be um does it have to be clean and that's where that obsessiveness comes in and i have to um just trust trust that that i'm on the right track and then sometimes i'm on a track and i feel like i'm too embedded in that track and and it's becoming really predictable so i pull myself off of the track and do something very unexpected to myself and it, it can be very painful at times but it's often um, where I get the best resolution for a piece. So. That's such a great piece, if I can just interrupt. I love that piece. <laughs> I love that piece. Thank you. Saint. Saint. <laughs> it is really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and how about you, Julie? Um, I, I totally think of my work as process driven. Um, I, I, I never have uh, an image in my head. I never have uh, a set idea of what I want something to look like. I, I literally just start by pouring paint, pouring, scraping, dripping. And um, it's, it's, I start with chaos and then I sort of hone in on an image. So it's really sort of subtractive in a way. Um, even though it's even though I'm adding layers, it's subtract subtracting the noise um, to get more and more and more and more focused on uh, pulling some image out of it. Um, and I I have such incredible uh, uh, love for material that uh, I I wind up just seducing myself while I while I'm painting um, and that materiality is I hope come I hope comes across and the surface the surface of things I'm extremely interested in the surface of things and um, you know I have so many different bodies of work because something that Tamar says something that happens for me too is that as soon as I feel like I have uh, understood something I don't want to, I, I, it, becomes, it becomes boring and I don't want to repeat myself. So I try a whole nother material, a whole nother process. So I'm discovering process while I'm discovering image too. And so, you're exploring ceramics now. And now I'm exploring ceramics. Yeah, that's really fun and frustrating at the same time. And exciting, yeah. Yeah. Great, and Meg? Um, I um, share a lot with both Tamara and Julie, um, but I also, um, especially for the large scale works, work from um, sketches. So I do keep a sketchbook and I make drawings um, and small models and then I blow them up and see what they look like on a large scale. And if they work, that's great. But if they don't, then I cut them up and sew them together again a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so some of um, the process is really about um, thinking about the form and then um, once I'm actually painting the form, that's when um, the kind of um, experience of being inside the painting really takes over. And um, I may have an idea about what I'm going to do, but all bets are off. It could totally, totally change. Love that. Um, and I do like to leave, um, I think part of the question was, um, is there evidence in, yeah, in the, in the way. Of the process, yeah. Yeah, part of the process. Um, and I do leave my stitches very visible. I did not um, grow up as a sewer. In fact, strangely, I hate sewing. Um, <laughs> And um, I've come to, to realize that it's really um, an important part of my work. Uh, there's a lot of hand sewing and you can see the stitches 
Um, and there's also generally, even though the work is volumetric and sculptural, uh, there is almost always a front and a back mm -hmm. to pieces. And I may even work on both in while I'm painting and then decide as I'm going if I like one side or the other more. Um, and because they most often, except uh, when they're being used in a ballet, most often they hang on the wall. Um, so you can usually see part of the, um, the back oh, yeah. um, of the piece when you look at the side of the work and that's all visible. Yes, and when you were installing, you showed us the back of this piece. <laughs> yes. Really yes. yes, which is a totally different, completely. different color scheme completely. Yeah. And then you do see the, the backs of them as you kind of sneak up and look in them. You often also get a, sort of a glow from the colors behind. Um, that's an awfully nice. Color. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's, uh, it differs from the piece. Nice. Okay, I am going to um, ask Noelle Hersag, who is um, also a former student, to ask a question. And mm -hmm. I'll just tell you a little bit about Noelle. She graduated from St. Rose in 2019 and is pursuing her MFA at the University of Oregon. Her solo exhibition, Leftovers, is currently on view in the university's Laverne Krauss Gallery. Noelle is a member of Anti Aesthetic a contemporary art space in Eugene, and also of Ditch Projects in Springfield, Oregon. So Noelle. Hi everyone, it's really great to be here, thank you. Um, I feel like I have a lot of questions. I've been a little familiar with all of your work over the past few years. Um, I think I, I've been following your work, Julie, through Instagram, and it's been really exciting to see you explore clay. Um, and I think this has triggered this question about life forms of the work and how long works might last or might change uh, over time. Um, I see, you know, this exhibition being viewed through the lens of um, the Earth's future and environmental crisis. Um, it brings up this question a lot for me as a maker, like uh, just that anxiety of contributing more stuff to the world. Uh, and I kind of wonder how each of you might view that in your making and um, how long your works might live or how they might change after their quote complete. You mean, you're not talking about archivability. You're not talking about will they last because mm -hmm. they're, you're talking about- Not happy. quite. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I worry, I mostly worry about my sister. <laughs> Cause she's gonna, <laughs> if anything happens to me, what is she gonna do with a room full of work? Um, I, I will honestly say that there are times when I say, why am I making, just, why do I keep making more stuff? But um, it's what I do, so I keep doing it. That's, that's, you know, I know, I know I'm not, I'm contributing to the problem, putting more and more stuff in the world, but um, it's what I do, I can't help myself. I'm a bad citizen. What can I say? Uh, I'm with Julie. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm afraid I don't think about it at all. I, I guess I'm a total egoist. I um, sometimes I will recycle a failed work into a new work. So maybe I um, maybe that's but that is pretty unusual in my practice. So yeah. What about you, Tamara? <laughs> it is something I've thought about, about having all these pieces. And a lot of the pieces I have that I've made, I've actually am storing here in this place. And 
that bugs me that they're that they're in containers and they're not being um, seen. I do recycle failed sculpture and I save a lot of failed stuff. So it's um one of my friends told me that it's okay to throw things out and they don't have to keep everything because I'm not saving the world by keeping it in my house. So I do have thoughts about, about how much stuff, what kind of material I'm using. Um, can I remake something? Can, and I have tried that with a couple of pieces where I'll take something and say, okay, I can give you, I'll, I'll give this one another life and make a completely different piece out of it. And that's really satisfying. I have to decide that I don't want to have this um, piece that I can let go of that piece and that, that I don't need the archive that maybe a photograph of that piece is enough if I am going to do that. But I think this is a, this is a problem of being an artist and mm -hmm. I, I think that we destroy as human beings, we destroy things. And that's part of the process of making art. I did recently, uh, when I had to clean out my studio in the city, um, not that many years ago, even though I moved up here nine years ago, I kept all my stuff in, in uh, my loft there, even though I rented it out. And when I cleaned it out, I threw out um, over 50 paintings. Some of them were, you know, 72 inches by 60, big, small, mostly large paintings. And uh, I threw them out in the hallway of my building. The next morning, they were all gone, which if I could throw a garbage out there and it would last a week. So I didn't know where they went. And I asked my super and he took them all because he paints. And I know what he paints. He paints smiley faces and things like that. And I thought, damn it, I should have gotten rid of my name on the back of all those paintings. <laughs> but I did not feel good for the purge. I still wake up in the middle of the night and I think, why did I throw that painting away? I think it's hard to throw out work. I mean, I do, I do paint over things all the time. But if I've finished it and shown it and haven't sold it, then it's hard to re rework it. Mm -hmm. Then it either goes in the, tr then it, it went in the trash or it just gets put into storage. But it is a problem. A lot of, a lot of artists, you know, we pay, we pay for storage to store our work. Mm -hmm. And I also worry about my sister yeah. and, and all my stuff, something I, think about at least once a week. Um, <laughs> Meg, do you think about anybody having to deal with your stuff? Uh, my kids are just going to get stuck with it. But then you <laughs> see, I've got my mom's work that I'm going to um, take on. And she and I have started talking about that already. You know, she'll say, would you like me to start going through the storage area and making decisions for you so you don't have to make difficult decisions later? Um, and it's funny because I know so much of her work that I feel very um, stricken with how much I relate to it or love it. So I think I will have a difficult time on my hands um, <laughs> when it's my time to deal with her work. So maybe we'll just keep passing it on and on. <laughs> I don't know. Well, don't thank know. you. All. Yeah. Thanks, Joanne. Um, this actually leads right into another question. Um, in speaking with each of you or in hearing you speak publicly, I've noticed that you have strong connections to family members who either make or made artworks or cultivated aesthetic experiences in your lives. Can you tell us a little bit about how family history and connections play a role in your artistic practices? Um, well, my, my, mother was, my mother was an artist when I was a kid. She, well, she had gone to Parsons when she was a kid. She grew up in the city and uh, she went to music and art high school and she went to Parsons 
and she was always drawing things uh, and she painted for, for a while and the garage was a ceramic studio. So those things were always really important uh, around my house. And I remember always making stuff. I would always just sit on my floor in my room for hours and hours. I would use felt and I would wrap little corks with felt outfits and make little dolls. I was always making things. But I think it was when I was in second grade, we had to make um, puppets out of to <laughs> toilet paper rolls and paper mache. And I remember exactly what my puppet looked like and really big ears. And, <laughs> and my teacher at the time, uh, Mr. Newman, thought mine was terrific. And it was the first time anybody thought something that I did was just terrific. My mother, my mother and my father, they were never the ones to, you know, put my drawings up on the refrigerator. No, my mother never, my parents don't own one, one ounce of my work. In fact, recently when I was cleaning out my studio with my mother and I found all, a stack full of figure drawings, I used to do figure drawings all the time when I was a kid at the Brooklyn Museum and some of them were really good. And I said to my mother, well, relatively speaking, and I said to my, my mother said, throw them out. And I said, but some of these are good. She goes, you know, you can draw. What do you need these for? <laughs> so saving work was not a big deal. But when Mr. Newman thought my puppet was the best one in the class, it was like a revelation. It was like, I'm good at something. And I just, that was it. That was it. I was the art kid because I was good at something. So that's, that almost that almost changed me more than my, my mother, but I think my mother always made stuff. She was always making stuff my whole life. Um, and so I always made stuff too. So that really was because of her, I have to say. She's still making stuff. She's 88 and she's still making stuff. One, one last story. <laughs> one time uh, my parents decided to, they, they put their money together and they invested, they bought, they wanted to buy a piece of art. They bought um, a Chagall, it was a print. And it was on the mantelpiece above the um, fireplace in my living room when I was growing up and my grandparents came over and my father was so proud of it. And he said, mom, dad, look. And they pointed at the Chagall and I was about, I think I was six. And my grandmother leaned into my face and she said, Julie, did you do that? <laughs> and that's my favorite art story, growing up with art around my house. And I can hear my husband howling in the other room. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know it doesn't have anything to do with the question, but anyway, it's a good story. And how about you, Tamara? Yeah, so... I talk a lot about my grandmother's influence on me and it's more of um, philosophy than an aesthetic. So I grew up around in a community of Ukrainian immigrants and uh, they were very grumpy and bitter and they would never let us forget how hard their lives were and that life is hard, period. So my grandmother, for some reason was joyful and tolerant and generous. And she just was the opposite. We had so much fun with her as kids and her, her, she had this um, side hustle, which was mending clothes. She did that. She did that like, you know, everywhere she lived, she was always fixing someone's pants from church or working at the dry cleaners fixing clothes there. And then she also made incredible peasant food. And I just loved, I didn't think, I didn't think about waste, waste being wasteful as a child, but she taught me how to take what you have and make things with it. So I have had that in my practice since the beginning. Anytime something was really precious I haven't been able to use it. And um, 
and it, and and it even happens in my in my life like i'll buy a really nice piece of cheese and it, it'll sit in the refrigerator i'm waiting for the the perfect moment to eat it and it and it just you know dries up and it gets mold on it or something too much mold but um my my grandmother really taught me um how to how to adapt and that is something that i think about that shows up in my work a lot. It's like, um, <laughs> making yeah, something I can out see of that nothing. for sure. Yeah. Making, yeah, it's making something out of nothing. Making making stuff with whatever I have on hand, yeah. and and um, and the, and the really really, yeah. I mean, I think I get a, like I get something out of out of taking something that's hideous and transforming it or giving something and a chance to be better to be to be good to be great to be better than it was and um i do that with everything in in my life you know i'm always thinking about how can this be better so Lovely. it comes into my practice all the time yeah and how about you meg um yeah i was just really enjoying what tamara was saying and and uh relating to it because I, I also um, have a grandmother who made things from what was around her. And I think, I think probably a lot of us do, right? It, because, um, you know, I'm just thinking about quilters who make things out of um, little bits of clothing that might be around. Um, my grandmother made, um, she made tapestries and embroideries from yarn that was um, left over from um, a cotton dyeing mill that her, my grandfather had inherited in his family and it, and it went under. Um, so I have a lot of her work and I find that really inspiring. Um, but then I also have a mother who's an artist and a um, and uh, is very daring. She makes paintings and sculptures and did a lot of performance, feminist performance um, in the 80s. And so um, I had a lot of exposure to a lot of really powerful work. Um, and in addition, my parents were both art historians. So I come from this totally privileged background with a ton of exposure. Um, and I really think it's, it's no wonder that I became an artist because I um, was a child who, um, who communicated primarily through making things. And my parents framed so many things that I made and put up on the wall, um, including a piece that I remember that said, a circle is round. I made it in preschool and it was a circle. Um, and they had it up in, in their house my whole childhood. Um, so yeah, I was very, very lucky and privileged. Well, I'm gonna have another student um, with a question. This is John D'Souza, who I see up there on the screen. Hi, John. And John, since receiving his BFA in studio art in 2019, um, John D'Souza has been active in the regional art community through working at Art Oh My, assisting professional artists, exhibiting at artist-run spaces, and participating in the artist residency program at the Art Center of the Capital Region. So, Hello. Hi, John. Hi, Thank John. you. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. I can't wait uh, to go see this show. Um, it's great listening to all your responses to these uh, questions. And we're in just such a crazy, chaotic time. And, you know, everybody's been really more or less like absorbed in politics, like more or less. And we're in a very, I don't know, everything's very transformative, but also destructive and there can be those moments of despair so I'm curious like how you may like re restructure society to benefit like art schools 
artists, but also local arts and culture communities. Wait, what was the question? I got so caught up by the <laughs> images here. <All> right. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I was waiting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, John. Sorry. No, that's okay. I'm curious how you might restructure society to benefit um, art schools, artists, but also local arts and culture communities. Uh, how, how we personally might do it, or how we would do it if we had the power? I, I guess so, just sort of like, like imagining like, like what do you envision would be like beneficial to uh, like arts institutions or schools, education and creative communities? Well, too bad the United States isn't like other places where artists are already important people or, or their, their work is valued more. Here, I think art is really, you know, about, it's a commodity, it's about the market. I mean, even Jerry Saltz today said, you know, fuck stocks, buy art. So, and, 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 and it just, to me, sort of sent the wrong message. But um, I don't know. I know we all understand the value of art and how if you can, ex if you can excel at art as a little kid, just like me and Mr. Newman, it's a, you know, a, a well from which you can draw any kind of self-esteem for the rest of your life. And kids do so much better in math and science and everything through the arts. But it's 2021. And I don't know why people don't get that yet. And why they're canceling all these art programs, like right at St. College of St. Rose. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how to you know, flip that switch. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough nut to crack because we haven't figured, we haven't figured that out. I, you know, maybe if we weren't, you know, because it's a capitalist society and we're so money driven and well, I won't, I won't tell that story, but I, anyway, uh. I don't have a good answer. Maybe somebody else does. Um, well, I was just thinking, John, I just learned about this program called the New York City Crit Club, which is an alternative to, um, to MFA programs, and it is low cost. You don't go anywhere. It's, it's basically artist um, critiques with artists who are visiting artists and then a community of other artists over Zoom, so you continue making your work. Um, and, you know, because so many artists uh, go into debt um, doing graduate school work, I think that's a great alternative and, and maybe it, it will sort of equal the, make the playing field a little bit more equal in terms of, you know, who can go to, um, who, can, who can create some time in their lives to concentrate on their practice when we also have to um, make a living. And um, you know, I still, um, at this point in my practice, still know only a handful of artists who actually make a living at their art. Mm -hmm. um, and make a, make a good living just making their artwork because it is just so hard. Um, so to be able to, you know, I, I was enthused about that, you know, um, about that alternative, but I, I can't, you know, I can't deny that it is just not, um, you know, it's not a, it's not a world that we live in, especially here um, in the States with systemic racism and poverty and climate crisis and crazy politics. I, it's just not a world that really um, it is allowing for equal representation of artists, and, you know, or, um, or 
putting the spotlight on um, the importance of artists. So. Thank yeah, you. And I would echo that and say that value is the biggest question here. And um, I feel, feel this and I still struggle with this, that, that um, what we do is not valued by most people in our society. I see this in other cultures where, where art is valued as, I, 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 think, I think that, that it varies from, from culture to culture. I've seen other places where, where art is subsidized. I don't really, I don't, I haven't done any research on, on that to know how sustainable that is, but I just, uh, I just know that I struggle as, a, as an artist uh, just be, because I, I constantly have to tell myself what I do is, is valuable. And, 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 I've, and there's been so much pushback against that from, from the outside. So I'm finding that constantly. Um, to answer your question about how I would make it better, um, you know, I have a lot of issues with, with late capitalism. So I think starting there and restructuring that would be the, the bigger thing and then trying to figure out how, how to get down into, um, and specifically art and, and deal, with, deal with it on that level. I just, I don't have any ideas about that. You stumped us all. <laughs> yeah, you really did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just. It is really, really, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to go over my time. It is too, too bad the idea that um, excellent and, and communication through art would be trumped by um, making money, that, that money could, could sort of negate. Um, the importance of of communication and and humanity and yeah, <laughs> it's a tough time. <laughs> I wanted to. We're at about eight, maybe a little. Oh, we're at eight ten, and so we wanted to not. We were concerned to kind of keep this um, at a nice length, so we didn't get all give you all Zoom fatigue. Um, but I did want to open it to questions from the audience. Um, the image of Meg's piece with uh, the performance with your work, um, that made me think about collaboration and um, how collaboration might be important to each of you in your process. And if that's still continuing through this pandemic world. Um, how collaboration is taking other forms? That's a great question. Um, before COVID, I um, had a year um, where I did a lot of collaborations, including with this um, choreographer, Julia Gleick, and um, five on-point ballet dancers. But also I collaborated with Tamara, on a piece, a sculpture that we made together. Um, and I also collaborated with the woman who lived in London. So I suppose I could still do a collaboration like that in these times where I sent her um, some cloth and then we discussed together how she was going to cut it and sew it um, and attach it to a sculpture she was making. Um, and that was really fun. And um, I have no problem with collaborating anyway. I think it's so much fun and so interesting. Um, but I just have not done any collaborations during this past year. I think it's been all I can do to just keep my own practice um, going, not to say that a collaboration would necessarily take away from my practice. I found that it actually kind of feeds it, but, um, you know, just also the 
the reality of being a mom to three children who are homeschooling and getting um, out to the studio in any tiny bit of spare time I might have, um, that has that has just kind of taken um, all the energy that I have. What about what about you, Julie? Oh, I did. Um, what year was it? In two thousand and ten, I think it was. Back then, my work was really. Um, I was really interested in Indian miniature paintings, and the work was very related to, to that. My my painting or just everything from the palette to the to the structure and the compressed composition, and and I started borrowing um, some of the uh, s typical uh, elements from nature and copying them into abstract forms, and. During all that time, I was I was going back and forth to India um, every other year for months at a time, and I had a really close friend who was a traditional miniature painter. And um, finally, I said we should do a collaboration, where because uh, a lot of the Indian miniature painters are, um, they'll work with Western artists. They'll just take direction. Somebody will say. Put a, put a cow here and a this there. And so he had worked with some Western artists, but I said, no, these are half mine, half yours. And um, I stayed in a hotel, a small hotel. I had the swine flu and we were working on these paintings together for um, I think four months. And they were, it was the hardest project I've ever done but um, it was also the most wonderful project I'd ever done because we realized that it was because we had such affection for each other and respect for each other and um, uh, admiration for each other that we were, and trust that we were able to do it. And we came up with, um, out of that, we had a show in, the, in Chelsea, uh, of those collaborations and it got a huge full page write up in Art Forum and another one in Art America. And they were, I think they were really pretty amazing uh, pieces. But, um, and then I also, during COVID, uh, I was doing a collaborative project with my two uh, good friends, Mara Held and Laura Battle. We were doing ceramic pieces together. We'd each start a piece and then we'd pass it to the next one and then pass it to the next one. So every single piece had three different hand, sets of hands on it. And um, that was interesting. That was, that was really fun. I think we did some good work too. And I think we learned a lot from each other. And just recently, a good, I have a good friend who's an artist in, um, in Portland, Oregon. And he said, you know, we should do one by mail. But for the, and I want to do that. But for the longest time, I've been wanting to do this project um, uh, called uh, Lost Dogs and just write to my friends and have them send me uh, pieces that they started that they never finished that they were going to throw away and that I was going to work into them and because every time you start with somebody else's work you enter into a place you would never have gotten to on your own so I love the idea of collaboration and I would like to do it more. And one of these days I'm gonna get my Lost Dogs uh, project out there or started, I mean, but that's it for collaborations. I talk a lot, sorry. <laughs> and how about you, Tamara? Well, last, was it 2019, Meg and I worked together yeah. on the piece that she mentioned, which, which was, um, it, that was very satisfying. And I think Meg has um, really good, she had very good boundaries. So that was helpful because we had a time constraint and we also just um, decided like, okay, you do that here and I'll do that here and then we'll meet again. And then we, I think we met twice and it came together. Um, I love that. I had, what's that? I love that piece. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And actually those pieces have, have uh, Meg has, has her part that she mostly worked on and I have mine here and they're becoming different things. So 
Um, yeah, there was a, a piece that I, a, a bunch of things I made with a friend in my last um, home in Brooklyn, which was Bay Ridge. I got really involved with artists who were also activists when I lived there. And there was a really great group who was trying to flip the Senate and, and um, Congress at the time. So they did a fundraiser um, about gerrymandering. So the topic was gerrymandering and my friend Janine Bardo and I got together and we made um, a bunch of, of pieces based on the gerrymandered district that we lived in. And we did rubbings and all kinds of things. A lot of the stuff we did was outside of what looks like or what people would connect with me. So I actually used another name. But that was an interesting uh, experiment in, in sales because everything I made for that sold. Oh, <laughs> and um, that's unusual for me. But the price point was much lower. I could do that with a different name. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Carla, did you have a question? Sort of. It's just, um, I mean, kudos to all you artists who are able to do all this because being an artist is um, so much more than just going in your studio. And I'm just wondering how everybody is, you know, do you just go with that and uh, let the rest of it happen or how much of your time are you able to really devote and how you promote yourself you know what I mean it's it's very right brain left brain it seems and some people have such different ways of doing it you know what I mean or or if you just kind of let it fall into place and let it happen or if you actually purposely try to um, work on that other part that doesn't seem so natural for so many artists, so many studio artists, you know? You mean the business side? Right, the business side, which um, really is so, seems so opposite of a studio practice in many ways. Yeah. Um, Meg, do you wanna take that? Well, I was just thinking while you were talking about how, um, I have a really like a, a really intense body memory of um, walking up and down the stairs of a big gallery building in Chelsea with a <laughs> with a binder full of slides um, in the early '90s because somebody had told me that was the only way that I was going to get anybody to look at my work, and I'm so grateful that we live in the time we do now because Instagram has just made that all so much easier. Um, I love, especially over this last year, I love that I can put um, work up on Instagram and I, and I, if it goes somewhere, that's great. If it goes to somebody's eyes, wonderful. But if it doesn't, there's, you know, a hundred really good artist friends who will, see it and who will um, like it. And that might seem so trivial, but on those bad days in the studio or where I feel like, why on earth am I doing this? It's so awesome to see friends, you know, putting little hearts next to my piece or silly, goofy emojis or whatever. So I know that's not really the business side, but um, that's, that's, I feel like the, one of the main things I do is Instagram and it, and it just seems so much easier than, um, than sending out a bunch of emails or going in person to different places. You know, I know lots of artists who, who have the great fortune of not having to switch personalities when they do the business side and they can kind of walk into a space and say, hey, you should buy this because I'm awesome and this work is amazing and check it out. Um, but I feel like a total loser when I speak like that. And, um, and so I just hope that all that stuff is gonna happen 
um, which might be, you know, I don't know if that's the right approach or not, but that's what I do. Um, I go through cycles where <laughs> I will work on, you know, I, I, I call them my PR days. So I'll have days where depending on what, what's going on, I, I have to alert people of something that's timely that's happening. And I will spend, um, time on Instagram, <laughs> um, emailing, texting people, just letting them know, hey, this is going on, this is up. And, and um, also just documenting is part of it too, documenting things so that, so that I can use images to promote, because I do think the images are the strongest way to promote something. And um, I, I don't, uh, I find it exhausting actually, I really do. And I was just asking a friend yesterday if, if he could tell me how to not exhaust myself. And he said, well, you don't have to post every single day. So now I know that from him. But I go through periods where I do absolutely no, no promoting. And then there are periods where I, I do no artwork and I just do my side hustle, which is bookkeeping or I'm wrapped up in some other project I have to deal with. And it's um, the thing that I have accepted is to me in my life, there's no such thing as balance. And in some ways I really appreciate that I don't have the same day over and over again. Like uh, my structure is constantly morphing. Even like the times that I wake up are, are changing, you know, like last year I was waking up at six and now I'm waking up at eight, you know, <laughs> but I think, I think that's part of it's the, the COVID and also um, having the, the nighttime studio practice, which I picked up on, which, which is actually re really replacing um, socializing because I was somebody who grew up eating dinner with my family every single night. And once I became an adult, I, I had like a dinner dinner companion every single night and now it's just me. So I'm sitting in my studio eating my dinner at the, at the studio table or wherever it is that I happen to be working, you know? How about you, Julie? Well, I mean, it's different now than it used to be, but I remember back in the old days, I had a friend who always had, we used to send out slides um, rather than send JPEGs. And she always had 80, count them, 80 wow. packets of slides out at a time. And that blew my mind. Um, but I've always been really bad. Like if there was a curator I wanted to talk to, and I saw them coming, I just would cross the street or turn around and run the other <laughs> way. I am the worst person at self-promotion. Absolutely the worst. I get, I start to shake, I turn pink, and I just act like an idiot. So I just sort of don't do anything. And um, I was always sort of lucky in the past that you know, I would just have my head down working and one person would want to come to the studio. I'd have maybe one or two people a year, but that person would want to give me a show. So then I'd have a show. And then the next two years, somebody else came, the only person, and she wanted to give me a show. So I had four shows with her. So I was lucky in that I didn't have to do um, what I hate doing. On the other hand, I feel very unlucky because I feel like if I was good at that stuff, I would be in a much better position. <laughs> but uh, it's a trade-off. You know, I never wanted to be the kind of person that was glad handing every night. I have one friend, we go to openings together, and he goes up to people and he shakes their hand, says his name, and says what show he's in right then and there. And that to me is insane. I could never do that. But, but artists do that all the time. 
They just go up to, you know, who, the, the dealer or whose ever show it is and say, hi, I'm so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so -and, -so, and I've, I just got a review in Art America. And it's like, <laughs> who are you? But and, and that's, that, how, that's how you I, get someplace, because they remember but, you. But I also, I also see that backfire. I see people so re repulsed by that. So yeah. it's, it's, you don't know really what's going to work. That's, there's no formula. And, no, there's uh, no formula, but I think it, yeah. you, for, it generally works if you do something. I mean, you put out yourself out there in some way. The more you put yourself out there, I think the, the more things might come back. There was one thing I, I wanted to say. You mentioned that your friend had the 80 packets of, of slides. Yeah. And I had a friend a long time ago. She told me, you need to have art goals. If you don't have any art goals, you're not going to, nothing's going to happen. And I made a list of everything that I, that I wanted and I started applying for them and I got a lot of them. Oh. So that was, that was really, uh, I don't know if I was just lucky or, or, <laughs> or, but, but if I didn't apply for it, I obviously wouldn't have gotten it. The thing is that I'm at a place in my life where I don't know what I want. I don't have any art goals right now. My, the only art goal I have is to keep making work yeah. and hopefully like get some, some grant money here and there. That's, that's all, but it's not concrete. So. <laughs> well, thanks so much, you guys. That was wonderful. You're so, you're all so engaging and honest. And thank you so much as well to our wonderful student um, participants. That's great to see your faces. <laughs> um, so thank you all for joining us and yay. That little clap <laughs> emoji. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Wonderful. Everybody. Thank you. Great, Great questions. questions. Thank you, all you guys.